Hey everyone, welcome to No Reserve. This is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. And we are here to help you make sense of the enthusiast car market, whether you're buying, selling, or simply watching. Now this week was a super fun episode. We talked about everything from a Testarossa with the big mirror to a pile of parts that sold for a million dollars, a weird two-stroke Saab, a Jaguar E-Type, And oh my gosh, a uh, Mercedes SLK for $8,000. We're going to get a Mercedes convertible for $8,000. Kind of amazing. I'm Larry Webster. I'm the editor of Haggerty Media. And I'm Dave Kinney. I'm the publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. Now between us, we got decades of experience buying, selling, and driving the cars we love. Plus, we're backed up by the data of the Haggerty Valuation Tools. All right, we're recording this on a Thursday, September 29th. I mean, the market is still humming along in a very strong way. Let's jump right into our opening bid segment. Dave, what's what's what have you noticed lately? Well, I'm right up in uh, uh, Newport, Rhode Island for the Audrain Concours. And uh, alongside that Concours, Bonhams has got a, uh, an auction going on. And I'm about to go down and take a look at a uh, 66 Maserati Mistral. This is the 4,000 coupe, the, uh, the four liter car. Uh, They made Maserati Mistrals for a long period of time, and they had uh, lots of options. This one seems to be the one that you might want because it's got the biggest engine. It's also got uh, uh, manual transmission, which was not a given on all these cars. Good colors all the way through. So um, uh, looking forward to looking at this car. I like the Mistral. They're a six-cylinder car in an eight- and 12-cylinder world, and I get that. Um, they also had Lucas fuel injection, which, you know, I don't think anybody, anybody would be, uh, tough to, uh, you know, have trouble believing that it could be problematic at times. Um, this one's got the, uh, a Weber conversion on it. So that's kind of nice as well. Um, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to looking at this car. I Hi, follow wait. these cars just about forever. So why do you like them? I mean, it, it's a sixties Italian coupe without a V12. It's got half a V12 essentially, right? A straight six. Yeah, so, exactly. But it, it, I mean, it, it's it's old school Maserati before you know they they went to the Bora. So this oh. is kind of you know if you if you think about the Bora being a you know a, a car apart, uh, this is one of them. This is a, a different type of car than uh, than the Bora by a long shot. So it's cool from that standpoint. By the way, Dave, we're supposed to talk about in segment one cars that have already sold, so we could talk about the the price. So okay, we'll let that go on this one. But tell me. What is the story with Maserati in the 60s? You said it's pre this. Were these really good driving cars? Were they really good uh, Ferrari alternatives? We know Maserati in the early years in the 50s was a racing powerhouse. But by the sure. 60s, they were losing that, right? So what's what was yeah. happening? Yeah, so this is, um, uh, you know, the, the 3000 uh uh, Maserati. This is basically the continuation with a beautiful Frua body on it. This is a Gran Turismo. So it's, it's a you know one of those cars that you would take around the continent and uh, enjoy. It is not a you know complete high end car, but it has a lot going for it just because of the styling of the car. Um, I I don't worry about the six cylinder. I mean, there's a lot of cars that live in a different world than uh, you know the the BMW M1 is a perfect example. That's a car that lived in a V12 world and seems to be doing fine. Um, these cars can sell for up to about three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. We have them in the price guide for a number one three eighteen, number two two sixty two, number three two hundred five, and a number four one sixty one. I expect this car to wind up in the middle. I don't expect to hit the three hundred thousand dollar mark. Probably somewhere around the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark. Something like that would be expected. Yeah, these are super interesting. They're president predecessor to the Ghibli, and um, a lot of times these straight six engines they sound really freaking great you know and it's funny what you mentioned about that because like in the e-type you want it you want the straight six not the v12 version so there's definitely mm. some advantages oh we're gonna yeah, we'll, okay, we're, we're gonna argue about that okay yeah so, we, we can talk about that coming up so yeah. yeah the ghibli um you know that car really had a moment you know because as Ferrari daytona's the v12 again as they started going up close to a million dollars it brought up the ghibli's and you know these mistrals seem to be uh, similarly forgotten or have they been discovered? Um, what do you think? Oh, I, you know, look, I love the Ghibli. I love the Daytona, but if I had to flip a coin, I wouldn't flip a coin. I'd take a Daytona. I'll take the V12 at any time, but also the Ferrari name over the Maserati name, even though I love the Maseratis, but the Ferrari is hard to argue with. Uh, it's a front engine V12. 
uh, two passenger car. Uh, nothing wrong with that ever in the uh, world of Ferraris. Yeah. So these Mistrals, they probably found their natural resting point and aren't really going to pop is I think what you're saying, right? Yeah. But uh, if you're going to buy one, this is one ones to buy because you can buy them with a you know, 3.7. I mean, you know, it's, it's Maserati. So they made a 3.5, they made a 3.7. Oh, you know, hell, they probably threw in some three twos back there, too. I mean, it was just an amazing, uh, uh, you know, cottage industry Maserati was back then, not like they are now. And so uh, lots of stuff going on. But I really like the design of these cars. Yeah, that's that's why to buy it. The design. Lots of style, knockoff wheels. Um, Well, I'm dying to talk to you about the thing that really surprised me over the past week. It was uh, I'm going to butcher this name. It was it's a. It's a sports racer car that was sold at Goodwood Revival last weekend. It's a Cooper Xerox Oldsmobile. It was made by Cooper in the UK. It used an Oldsmobile V8. Bruce McLaren drove it. Um, a lot of uh, really big historians in the racing world, they found this thing. I think it was in South Africa as a pile of parts and a chassis. And they brought it to England. They put it on this uh, auction. It sold for a million dollars. And yeah. um that was just amazing to me. It's a really interesting car that it has. Um, uh, Roger Penske drove it and it was in all the famous races. But like, I guess my question for you, Dave, like, how do we know, how did they verify this was the actual car? And I guess that was the thing. That's the most important thing. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's a big deal in the, in the race cars. Cause we all know that, uh, you know, some guy got a rear end somewhere and decided to build an entire car and call it the original. So uh, that's a big, big problem with race cars. I guess the fact that this was sitting static for so long and was an abandoned car in South Africa means something. You know, when we talk about race cars, most of the time we talk about the tracks that it entered in, but more importantly, the race car drivers who drove it. And that's so much of the value because, you know, you're sitting here talking about legends who were involved in this car, you know, absolute legends. Also, I think Goodwood was the absolute best place to sell this car. So Bonham's really was smart with this one. Um, you know, it's got, I, you know, it's it's a true international race car. I mean, it's it, it's one of these you can't say was just an American car, was just a British car, you know, it was just a, a car from wherever. It was a collaboration car, which also is cool. Um, the problem when you're talking about these things, the usage is vintage racing and that's it. Um, but if you're into that stuff, uh, I could see that, you know, million dollars is justifiable for this. Oh, my gosh. The, the people I who mean, sat in this seat, I mean, think about it. Yeah, I mean, this would get you an entry into every – uh, exclusive vintage race around the world from Le Mans to the Monaco historic to the Rolex at Laguna Seca, it would get you in everywhere. You know, what brings to mind when I see the photos, a couple of things, you know, Doug Nye is a really well-respected racing historian. So he uh, put his stamp of approval on this thing, which certainly helped it. Uh, but I'm also thinking about um, Miles Collier and his uh, really impressive collection down in Florida and Naples, the Revs collection because they do a lot of these restorations too. And I'm looking at these parts and they even list in the auction catalog that there were seven iterations of this car. And Miles would say, okay, which of the seven configurations are you going to restore it to? Cause it needs a full restoration because you can see where they've cut off some of the tubes and stuff like that. And that would be a fascinating, really hard thing to, I think, uh, decide. And that's going to be interesting to watch. I think is who bought this car and what do they do with it? Because it, it's, it needs a lot of work. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I, and I totally agree. I, you know, when you have a car that was famous for being the first of a series or something like that, and then it was used and used and used, you have to figure out which of the, uh, which of the liveries, which of the uh, configurations yeah. works best for you. Uh, it shouldn't be just about the value of the car. It should be what works best. And maybe for the viewers, maybe for the people who want to see it or maybe for you. So you have these, uh, what do you say, eight options here, which is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, I mean, somebody bought themselves a really, really fun project, and I hope we see it out there in the next few years. Okay, what's next on your list? Uh, let's, how about we talk about an 86 Testarossa, um, you know, the car that uh, everybody loved to hate for the longest period of time. That would be the 90s and 2000s. They were never bad cars. Uh, they just have a very distinctive styling, you know, the cheese grater sides, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, on and on and on. I like these cars, but I like them when they're in great colors. And this car is not in a red and tan. Right, Larry? Well, what would you call this color? I mean, it's sort of like a brownish 
Um, yeah. This yeah. one was sold on Bring a Trailer last week, right? It went for 150 grand. I'm not. I gonna, mean, it is. I'm not going to attempt the my Italian on the name, but it, yeah, you're right. It's a it's a red brown. Um, Wait, why, why, Dave? This is what I, I'm confused about because you know I'm restoring a uh, 1975 308 GT4. Oh, this by the way, car that, yes, yeah, and it, everybody, it, it's satin under your uh, hood just for the uh, definitive. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay. I'm gonna put. I know it was repainting, but they didn't sell. Everybody hated them. They were ugly. They came in. I don't know, fifty different colors. So if you look in the original cars, right, they had these really weird eggshell blues. There was a lot of browns, and there's the two tones. And the factory and the dealer said we can't sell them, so they painted most of them black, red, or yellow. And now you're telling me that this weirdly colored Testarossa is actually more valuable because I don't think this color you're talking about does it any justice. Oh man, you're wrong again, Larry. I mean, no. come on. Okay, so you got your choice. You got your gold chains and you know the Italian pronghorn thing uh, going for the red and the uh, uh, the red and the tan cars, or you've got the uh, you know uh, Tibbs and whatever Sunny Miami Vice white with white with white. This is different from both of those, and that's why I like this car so much. I like the oddball colors, but guess what? So does the market now. I think if this car had been red tan, it would sold for at least twenty thousand dollars less. So I oh. think that the hundred and fifty that this car brought was right between our uh, Hegarty value two and three. We've got one thirty on the uh, on the uh, end for the for the number three. The number two is one eighty nine. 150. This is not a perfect brand new car by any stretch of the imagination. It does have a good car fax, but it had this replaced and this done and all that sort of stuff. Not always for the the right reasons, in my humble opinion. But uh, in the meantime, uh, I I wouldn't take this car uh, uh, down a notch from 150. I think it's worth every single bit of that dollars. Yeah. Okay. I, I I'll just make one more argument about the color. I mean, if you look at that body and how wide the shoulders are. It has those, uh, those those intake on the side, has those big mirrors. I mean, this car, just the design screams that it wants to scream. So to put it in a muted color, it's just a disconnect there. But a quick story, when I was a car and driver back in the 90s, a guy showed up from Long Island. He put two turbochargers on that fat, flat 12. And those cars, those tuner cars usually broke down. So nobody in the office wanted to go drive it and write about it. So they threw me the keys. And um, I remember driving, this was my first flat 12 testarossa and it's hard to describe the sound that these things make and just how good it is i remember just going under this overpass again and again so i could go under this bridge again and wind the thing out and uh they're really weird driving position because the steering wheel is so far away but uh they do deliver an incredible experience for really what is 911 new 911 money i mean great cars yeah um and by the way the uh, steering wheel that far away the traditional italian driving all the arms out, all the way driving. Um, yeah, there's a lot to not like about a Testarossa, but let's forget all that. It's a lot to like about a Testarossa. And, you know, it's a whaler. That's exactly what it is. The sound that you hear is just the wailing sound of that flat 12, worth every penny. But, I mean, as an investment, I don't think these are great investments, or I think they've they've stabilized. You remember when they were $60,000 oh. cars, and then Maybe five years ago, suddenly they went to 100, 150, and that's where they seem to have. I mean, the Haggerty price guide has sort of been at around that level for a couple of years now, at least, right? Yeah, I mean, it bounces up and down, but uh, yeah, that's exactly right. But I mean, Larry, do you buy your cars for an investment? I buy them because I like to drive oh. them. I know you got me. I know, I know, I know. It's not an investment. Hey, I've got I've got one coming up here too that uh, we should take a look at. It was on the MB market, uh, which is a lot of Mercedes Benz cars, but they've got a lot of other things in here. I think this was a bargain buy. I think we're going to actually possibly even agree with this. Uh, it's a 2001 Mercedes Benz SLK 320 Sport with 56,000 miles. Now, for the uninitiated, the uh, uh, the 320 is a car with that uh, Carmen built top uh, can be problematic at times. This car sold for eighty five hundred dollars. What do you think? Stick shift or manual? Sorry, oh stick shift or automatic? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to take a look because I just uh, I'm pretty sure it's right, yeah, automa automa automatic. Automatic. Yeah, most are automatics. Um, it, this car looks so sporting, sporty, sporty. Uh, it yeah. had that retractable hard top. It was a baby SL. I remember there was a great shot. They flew one in so we could drive it. I took it to the test track. It had one of the early five speeds. I was like, awesome. Mercedes Boxster. It's going to be sweet. 
<laughs> nothing even close. It's yeah. a uh, it's a Boulevard Cruiser. You don't even want. I mean, I would just say there's no advantage to having the manual transmission because the gearbox doesn't feel that good. It feels sort of ropey and and imprecise. So, yes, if you're um, if you're aware of what you're getting and this is what you want, that is a fantastic buy. I agree with you, Dave. Again, uh, you know, we've got we oh, man, we've got this in the price guide for uh, uh, seventy five hundred for a number four and twenty six three for a number one. So at eighty five hundred, you're talking number four money for this car. And you know, I'm sure it's got some problems. I'm sure it's got some things that want to be done. But you know, hey, as a quickie, it's fun stuff. Um, once again, we can talk about German versus Japanese. Maybe this uh, car will be a little more interactive mechanically. Uh, but, uh, but who knows? It'll be fun. Yeah. You know, most cars, once you cut the roof off, the chassis loses a lot of rigidity. So you'll know that when you go over, like, let's say railroad tracks, you'll, you can actually feel it jiggle. Um, they've gotten that a lot, lot better over the years, but this was one of the first convertibles that I ever drove that still felt like it had, they'd started with a brick of steel and then carved out the car and the SLK kind of has that. So it has this feeling of German build quality, even if you're, you know, to your point, there's probably some more electronics, a little more here and there, but overall quite a, a really good car. I'll just throw in there for that money. You can get a really, really nice Miata and that's going to be more fun to drive, but it won't have the three star badge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Miata, the you know, Miata trumps so many cars when you're talking about cars of this size and this class, because there's, you can do anything with a Miata. You can't do everything with an SL. So even when it's a uh, SLK 320. So right, there we are. I'm, I'm expecting you to put your money where your mouth is and buy one of these shortly, Dave. Let's move on to our kicking tire segment. This is auctions that are, are live now or, or soon to be. Um, and these are some of the things that, that have struck us as like something that we want to keep our eye on. I'm going to let you go first because you were telling me about one that I'm struggling to understand. So the floor is yours, Mr. Dave. All right. 1967 Saab 96. Now, not a 95. Come on now. It's the much better 96. Now, this car, uh, it's at Haggerty Marketplace, and it's got uh, a $6,000 asking price. So we don't know what it's going to go for. A number one on a Saab 96, which is, is definitely not a number one, is 30,400. Our number four is 5,500. This is a car with lots of needs, but, you know, it's a dreamer car. And, you know, we're all dreamers. We all love this stuff. Uh, the roly poly 96 list uh, look is just, uh, you know, awesome. People love these cars. They appeal across generations. This one's got a little bit of the tin worm in there. It's got some rust, so I don't know if it would be something for me. But it's six grand. Again, the argument, you know, uh, classic cars are expensive. Nobody can afford them. I think just about everybody with a job can afford a $6,000 car right now, unless they're... Wait, uh, why, why, is, why is it a dreamer car? What do you mean? Oh, you, no. You I see mean, it? Look, no, to put this car back together is a labor of love, okay? I oh, mean, I see. You're never going to get the money out of it unless you do absolutely everything yourself. But I would keep the patina on it. It's got, you know, paint that's peeling off. It's got all that sort of stuff. I'd fix the rust, have some fun with it. Uh, you know, maybe get a Honda S2000 engine and drop in it later. Just kidding. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Just no, kidding. Just kidding. But, uh, uh, you know, again, the low end of the marketplace, but fun stuff. Uh, you know, Saab yeah, always, always have been quirky. They always were. They always will be now that they're gone. You know, it's a it's a settled thing. But uh, this is about as quirky as you can get. It's a really neat car. I encourage everybody to go to Haggerty Marketplace to look at it. The photos are pretty good, but you can already see it was patched once. And now the rust has come back. But the these cars um, were some of the early ones built by a very quirky Swedish car maker that was doing things their own way. And this has a two stroke engine correct yeah exactly so uh just add gas and oil i mean come on that's awesome yeah so the two stroke is it's a different it's a it, it, mechanically they, it looks very similar to a four stroke engine but however every time the piston goes up the spark plug fires and there's another explosion so you get double the power post pulses for every crankshaft revolution which means there's more power for a given engine size. Now, the downside you alluded to is you got to mix oil to lubricate the crankcase and things like that. So they smoke. They're loud. They're really kind of weird. But in terms of like a small, light car that can do a lot, and especially what you point out as a classic, something really different and novel, it is hard to beat these things. The other, look, th think of it this way. Right now, there's a guy who's watching this 
and he's got two screens open. And the other one, he's ordering, you know, uh, a new gasket set for his Ferrari. And it comes out at $6,800. Well, what would you rather have, a Saab <laughs> or a new gasket set? Come on, okay? So, uh, you know, for a bunch, yeah, of, people, bunch yeah. of people, this isn't even a rounding error. So, uh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I grew up riding dirt bikes, so I love that smell of two-stroke exhaust. It's like it's like cologne to me or perfume. Yeah, so yeah I, grew up I, mowing, I, I grew up mowing lawns, so I have the same smell. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry for you, Dave. Oh, poor guy. Uh the one that I'm really excited about is something that is so far out of reach. It's just such a crazy looking thing. It's a racing version of the GTO, the 288 GTO. This was the, I think it was the first GTO since the original. It was in the late or early 80s, 84. It was basically a hot rod version of the Ferrari 308. And then they made some of these racing versions. And uh, I mean, it's at, um, it's for sale from RM Sotheby's and it's got all these cuts and slates and and openings and ducts and wings and it is about the baddest looking thing i've ever seen and um i, I can't explain it. it it's like i'm almost losing control of my bodily functions just looking at it so help me out here dave how well, crazy am i larry those are the things you didn't like about the testarossa and now you're saying you <laughs> like it on the 288 gto well this is this is the evolution eh? this is the uh one of what three, are you saying it right I did think, you say it right i think so uh, evolution um the evolution okay come on I, you know my italian is not it's not the same as donald osborne's okay but uh in the meantime um, they went, they made like three of these, right? They're just incredibly low production. Now in the Hegarty price guide, uh, here's a preview for you because, uh, this comes out on, uh, October one, when the new price guide comes out, uh, we've, yep. we've raised the standard car, not the Evolution, but the standard car to four, the 288 GTO, the, the 288 GTO to $4.1 million. So I don't know how much this is going to bring, but it's obviously going to bring a, bring a premium over the uh, over the the standard 288 GTO. If you just you know if you only have the 4.1 million for the uh, you know for the 288 uh, without the Evolution, um, but so I don't know, maybe five, maybe six wait. million on this car, or something like that. It's a lot of money. Wait, wait, Dave. I, I know you guys at the Haggerty Price Guide are you you just you're objective. You look at the data and what the sales are, and that tells you four and a half million for basically a twin turbo 308, which is what a GTO is. Four, what? 4.1. Come on now. Don't exaggerate. It's only 4.1. It's not four and a half. You just saved $400,000. Think of the money you could do with that. So, no, it's oh. $4.1 million for the nicest in the world. Okay. So let's go back down. We can, you know, our number three is $3 million, something like that. So 3.5, 3.55 for the number two. Uh, you can get the bargain ones, the bad ones. You can pick up under three million, maybe two point seven. It's a lot of money for a car that was selling for six hundred grand not too many years ago. So uh, they've really taken well, off. The lesson here is rarity, right? The two eighty eight GTO four point one million, and they made I think I want to say under three hundred. And um, you can correct me when I'm done, but we know the Ferrari F forty which was the later version, probably better. They made over a thousand. Those are still trading for about half of what a 288 GTO is, right? Yeah, but the GTO name is magic. And I think Ferrari realized they were making something special. I mean, it, okay, there's, you know, not with the Evolution, but the regular 288 GTO. You can see a lot of, uh, you know, of other Ferraris in it and not all of them expensive Ferraris as far as that goes. So, um, you know, we'll never know what this sells for unless uh, RM Sotheby's announces it because this is their private treaty, their, uh, uh, se oh, their sealed yeah. their sealed bid sale. So uh, we can sit here and speculate all we want, but we won't know for, uh, you know, until we find out from somebody, some other source or possibly the buyer. Okay. So, but yeah, this could be a five, $6 million car. It could be more. Yeah, I just have to say, uh, see if I can get this right. Uh, Max Gerardo, he's, um, you know, he's in the auction world. He's got the best accent I ever heard. You know, there's a company that does a lot of these racing versions of the, of the Ferraris. And I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to see if I can, I can replicate how he says it. Michelotto. Is that, <laughs> well, is that even close? Yeah, I'm not even going to try. But uh, in the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the, in in the meantime, uh, you know, we'll work on our Italian in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay, we'll, try, oh we'll try and get it better. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I think when, when he says that word in, in, in conjunction with this car, that adds half a million to the price, I think. Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, it's all about the presentation. I mean, you know, come on now. 
let's not be uh let's not forget it's steak and sizzle and this car has a lot of sizzle oh it's a, oh, a yeah. big heavy piece of meat too but it's got a lot of sizzle on it so all right well what what, what else are you looking at uh, you know, let's go back to some real old school stuff. And uh, we already started this conversation a little bit earlier. The V12 Jag, the E-Type. Um, we've got a, uh, what is it, 7475 E-Type here. Um, uh, this is a car that uh, a lot of people don't like because it's a V12. I'm going to make the argument that the Series 1 and Series 2 cars, all six-cylinder cars, are great People love them. They'll always be worth more, hopefully, than the uh, Series 3 cars. The Series 3 cars were V12s. So they took a six-cylinder car, they made it bigger, and they turned it into uh, the V12 E-Type, the Series 3 car. I like these cars. I always have. One of the reasons why is because um, I don't fit into a Series 1 or Series 2 Jag. Oh, A Series 3 hmm. Jag fits me. Uh, not a lot, and it's not great, and there's still problems with the pedal box down there because my feet are size 13 and they're wide. Uh, so I have to, you know, make sure I can not hit the brake while I'm hitting the clutch, or even worse, hitting the accelerator and the uh, brake at the same time. But in the meantime, um, these cars normally sell between a low of 52,000 to a high of 235. I don't think we're going to see that 235 too much longer. I think these cars are probably going down a little bit in value. But I think it represents a lot of uh, you know English car heritage for uh, whatever dollars you pay for. Yeah, I mean this is uh, Broad Arrows auction. They're selling the cars from Jim Taylor, his collection. It's coming up. I think it's uh, it's about a week away. And um, I, I hear you. I mean the V12 is a way to get the undeniably beautiful Jaguar E type shape, which by the way, uh, even Enzo Ferrari acknowledged was the most beautiful car ever made, um, without crazy money. But it just seems to me that it the V12 is a big, heavy engine. It's really shoehorned into that engine bay. It just sort of doesn't do the character of the car right, in my view, even if, you know, I'm being a little bit snobby here. They're probably really nice to drive. Yeah, actually, um, I like the cars. They come in coupes. They come in convertibles. Uh, you know, it, it's... I guess it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's for a lot of people, it's the sidebar of the, uh, of the E-type. Uh, I get it that it's not the, the beautiful form of the, uh, of the very early cars, but I think it's also practically, um, you know, I'm talking about 12 cylinder, uh, English cars and I'm talking about practicality in the same sentence. Uh, you know, I should probably slap myself right now, but, uh, when they're dialed in, they're fantastic cars. They're just fantastic cars. Well, I guess we'll see what happens. Uh, the one that, that another one that really got my eye was on it's on cars and bids right now. It's a 2002 Lexus SC430. Uh, just to give everybody an idea what this is, it's a it's a coupe version of the LS sedan with a retractable hardtop. And Dave, let me give you a little bit of background on these things because I was a car and driver at the time, and there was a press junket that Toyota hosted. First, you went to the Tokyo Auto Show, and um, you got to see the car there and they made a huge deal that they had opened up a styling studio in the South of France so that their designers could be in the proper environment to create, which was essentially a competitor to the Mercedes SL, but with the right elegance and luxury and all this stuff. They talked about it for three days and then they pulled the cover off the car and here it was. And like <laughs> everybody kind of bolted for the bathroom so they could laugh in private because they didn't want to do it publicly. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, this is one of the weirdest things I've ever been involved in. I mean, beautiful cars to drive. You know, they had the Lexus smoothness. They're reliable. They did all the things functionally that the Mercedes couldn't do. But holy smokes. Yeah. I, I mean. I have a friend who I think was on that same trip, and he started calling the car the Lumpsus uh, instead of the Lumpsus. <laughs> So, look, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? I mean, let's let's. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to be nice here. I'm going to be nice here. It's not my car. Uh, I love the way it drives. They're fun cars. Yeah. But here's the thing: it's also selling for fun money. I think the nicest one in the world, actually, I think Bring a Trailer had a, uh, a Pebble Beach edition that sold for uh, what was it? Something like uh, thirty five, thirty seven thousand dollars. I can't uh, can't see my notes here. So thirty five thousand two fifty. So they're cheap in terms of getting into them, 
Uh, they do have, uh, you know, you don't want to say Toyota reliability about a Lexus because somebody will come and slap your hand when you mention the, the T word around the, around the uh, Lexus. But um, they're fun cars. Uh, you know, that top uh, mysteriously still seems to work most of the time for most people that I know who have them. I, yeah. I, I have two, two friends or two acquaintances who have these things. But, you know, like I said, beauty's in the eye, by the eye of the beholder. We don't know what it's going to look like to the next generation of people. They might think it's the, the bitchiness looking right out no. there. So who knows? Listen, Dave, I mean, this Ferrari I'm restoring is the ugly duckling of Ferraris. Luigi Cinetti Jr., the son of the guy who brought Ferrari to the U.S., said when he saw it, he actually said to his dad, we got to sell the dealerships. This thing's insanely ugly. <laughs> So yeah, because you know, is. I mean, I now a Ferrari dealership's worth nothing. I mean, Larry, you and I can, you know, probably go for po- <laughs> our pocket change. We can look in our wallet and see what we can buy. Yeah, no, that, that didn't you, happen. You 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 bring up a good point. You know, uh, it is in the in the owner. There is a lot to like here because they are very well built cars. I mean, it's sort of really fascinating that Lexus division. I mean, there's a couple times when Toyota really went for the moon. And I think it was Lexus. And then the second thing that I don't think gets enough, um, it doesn't get enough uh, recognition is that Toyota Prius is an incredibly engineered car. And it is their moonshot for not a lot of money. Even if, you know, you say you don't like it, I'm telling you, the powertrain on that thing is is otherworldly. So anyway, back to this Lexus. What, what I love about it is it looks like it never left the dealership, even though it has 30,000 miles on it. Like somebody hampered this thing yeah so you are really getting quite a fun uh roomy luxurious roadster for not a lot of money so i see your point yeah and uh uh yeah it, it, it and also you know you can't argue toyota reliability from this generation of cars uh well the uh german cars of uh are shall we say a little more mechanically interactive uh, than the japanese cars <laughs> aka get your wallet out um, the, uh, yeah. the, these, these cars will go forever. So, uh, you know, there's, yeah, well, you, yeah, like anything they do wear out, uh, sure. a guy in our, a friend of mine has a LS, which is basically the sedan version of this and everything was custom to the Lexus. So things like the power steering pump goes, you need the Lexus one. It's not a Toyota one. So there are challenges just like with any old car, but somebody's going to get a lot of fun for this. What? Okay. We got one, time for one last more, one last one. What's your. What are you looking at this week? Wow. Um, hey, can we go back and re-review that spiker we talked about? Can we do that? Tell us about it. Why? All right. So this thing is uh, uh, currently available on Bring a Trailer. It's 357 miles. It's a 2006 Spyker C8 convertible. It is black with a, a tan leather interior. I'm going to change my mind about this. It was currently, oh, yesterday, it was at 236,121. I think this car is a total freaking sleeper the more i look at it the more i look at the um at the spikers look this thing's on uh, uh on a lot of the video games that people a little bit younger than us just a tad younger us are playing uh it's a very distinctive uh style although i really like it it seems to work like i was talking about uh, last week the jewelry on this car you know the engine turn dash all this sort of stuff is just absolutely awesome it's great stuff um, this car has 357 miles um, at 400,000 bucks, which is kind of maybe the top end of what this thing. Um, uh, I think um, that these cars have million dollar potential in the next 10 years. What? Yes. Yes. You heard it here oh. first. If you want to start an investment club, get 357,000 of your friends together and each put in a dollar. Or maybe you can get uh, you know the friends that have 10 Dave. bucks. No. Sorry. Okay, so we've got it on tape now. So we're going to go back 10 years from now, and you're going to say, Dave, you were right. I, Larry, have made a huge mistake. I should have bought this car. Well, you might be right. Here's a couple things that I think uh, go against it. Number one, that company's not in business anymore. Number two, there's no real racing heritage. And so one of those two things I think has to be uh, part of any conversation about a car that's going to appreciate. Because you look at this thing. And you're right. It's a piece of jewelry. It is going to be challenging to keep on the road despite it having an Audi engine. So, I mean, you've been in this longer than I have. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I don't see you you bidding. So maybe you're just full of it. Uh, Next thing you're going to tell me to buy a bunch of G-Wagons. We know what happened to those. So uh, 
Any any other bridges you want to sell? Yeah, me, no, 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 no. I'm right on this one. Um, it's got a, a lot of exotic uh, machinery behind it. Yeah, it's a 4.2 liter Audi. I get that. But then again, so is my Bentley, uh, a 4.2 liter Audi. Uh, oh, so, Bentley. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you know, we're talking about a uh, uh, you know a kind of great mechanicals. A, a dream that didn't come true for somebody from Spiker, but Spiker is also a name that resonates uh, back to aircraft. Uh, back to, you know, uh, the 30s and 40s, basically, uh, you know, so so even though, yeah, the car is not around anymore. Um, yeah, I like this car. I think it's a great investment. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Hey, uh, you know, you're looking at a guy who bought a Betamax. OK, so, uh, you know, I, I had an eight track. OK, so I, I admit it. I you know, yeah. absolutely admit it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you got those late all those late Monty Bentleys, too. So, yeah, your judgment is suspect. Let's. uh that was really fun. Let's move on to our questions because we want to be a service and we want to help people get to enjoy the cars that they really love. Uh, Dave from Grand Rapids, he wants to know what age or kind of truck should he and his teenage daughter pick to restore? Wow. Uh, this is also a good piece of information. It's, it's something that she would like to drive while she's in college. Whoa, that really narrows it, doesn't it? What what first jump to your mind? You go, I go first. I go big three, and my big three is GM, Ford, and Toyota. Um, so, what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm I am a huge fan of the Metal Dash GM products. Uh, so that would be the pickup, the Blazer, and the Suburban. And I think they stopped production about eighty seven, and they started maybe in the late seventies and. You know, most of them came with a small block V8, a lot of carburetors. But uh, the fascinating thing about that generation to me is they're not that awful to drive. Mm -hmm. They actually go down the road pretty well. They stop, they turn, and they're really distinctive looking. They're super durable. Um, So that would be my pick. Yeah, and parts availability and cost is probably, uh, you know, uh, another consideration. So, I mean, you know, hey, you can pull up at O'Reilly's and get, you know, not everything for the, for that truck. So I'm actually going to agree with you. Hey, you know, I, I, yeah, there's bolt of lightnings coming out here somewhere. I think maybe the Chevy might be the best choice. Um, you know, she's going to, uh, you know, they're both going to learn a lot, putting a, you know, putting a good one back together and buy a good one. And when I say good, no rust, uh, just avoid rust as much as you can. That adds oh. another dimension to putting a truck back yeah. together. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was just thinking the opposite. I was thinking some rust, you know, because the 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 sheet metal behind the wheels was so thin on yeah, those things, yeah. right? They basically always rusted. I was like, you know, you could probably it, it's not going to be like the best craftsmanship, but you could rivet a piece of metal on there, bondo it, paint it. There might be some lessons to be learned there. I, you know, that's where my head went. He and his daughter are going to do it. It's not about getting the car on the road. It's about maybe passing on some practical knowledge and having some fun together, but. Yeah. Right? No. no, I, yeah, I get it. Um, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about for, you know, for using it in college, that's going to be a, uh, a little bit of a, yep. That's going to be tough. An earbud out. So it uh, must be time to move on to the next question, but Hey, he's got a lot of choices. They have a lot of choices. So, um, I'd love to hear more about this project when it gets going. Uh, and I, I congratulate them for getting a truck. I think that's an awesome. Oh yeah. My son and I work on cars all the time. We have a ball. So good luck. Okay, Sarah from Bedford, Pennsylvania. She would like advice on buying tires for her 1972 Chevy Nova. Okay, this is going to be an interesting question, Dave. Should she buy bias ply for the original look or radials for better handling? Now, let me just set this up if you don't mind, Dave. The tires were originally struck constructed what they called bias ply, and it has to do with the way that the reinforcements under the rubber were these strands, the direction that they were run. And they switched to a radial construction right about this time. And those tires were more durable. They didn't, they didn't hunt as much. They did come with some downsides. So it's a, it's a constant struggle. Should you buy radial tires if your car was designed for bias plies and vice versa? Where are you on this debate? Yeah, I've been thinking about this. I saw this question uh, come through a little bit earlier. And um, so the only reason to have uh, bias ply, in my opinion, is that you want to have absolutely original on the car. I think 
<clears throat> radials are better tires all the way around, and I'd be very picky about what kind of radial I bought. You can also buy radial tires that look appropriate for 70s cars. A lot of manufacturers are making them, so they've got that, you know, maybe inch and a half or inch wide, wide inch wide white wall, something like that, if that's what you're looking at. Look, if it's a, no, if it's yeah. a Nova, there's probably a pretty good chance they're going to be black walls out anyway. Uh, might be some modifications. I think the only reason at this point to buy, and they're, by the way, they make radial tires that look like bias ply tires from that, from yeah, that yeah. time frame. I think the only reason you'd ever buy the bias plies would be you're looking for a hundred points at a, uh, you know, at a Chevy show where that would be judged and it would make a difference. What are your thoughts? Oh my gosh, Dave, twice. We agree. Wow. Uh, you sound so smart there because I was thinking like definitely the radials because they put more rubber on the road. Right. And therefore, they're safer. The braking will be better. All that stuff. So I am with you on that. Um, thank you so much for the question. We hope you're out there enjoying your cars. Dave, a lot of interesting stuff this week. Any final comments from you? Uh, I'm going to say it's the last few weekends uh, that you can get out and drive in lots of North America. So get out and drive. How's that? Yeah, I, that's a great tip. I think everybody should do that. I'm pretty feeling pretty good. I had this race car called the Radical that uh, I put it up on Facebook Marketplace and it sold in a day. So I guess I underpriced is what might you say, but at least it's gone. So um, it's something to be said anyway, for Anyway, thank that. you everybody for. Yeah, it's gone. All right. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Catch you next week on No Reserve. Take care.